uh, thank you for thank first of all thank you so much for letting us uh, interview like learn something from you it's like it was a class project but we would like really thank we are only like we're talking to an entrepreneur like you thank you so much well my uh, my pleasure uh, I, I Jack I just I've had a couple calls today I've been talking to some uh, academic friends who've been we did a big research workshop at the at the giant uh, Academy of Management conference on on ecosystems, and it was rather cool cool to see what what's being done, what what ideas people have. Um, sometimes the best part are hearing the really bad ideas and being able to sort of get people to uh, to shift gears because a lot of the the academic emphasis around entrepreneurial ecosystems is very top-down, very institution-led, and it's fun to find people who actually understand the bottom-up network-based uh, essence of, of, of ecosystems. I'm sure you've probably run across the name Brad Feld. Uh, Brad no? No. Brad Feld uh, was a very successful serial tech entrepreneur who became a very successful is now a very successful uh, venture capitalist <clears throat> and he was one of the architects in some ways of the transformation <clears throat> of boulder colorado into the great, great tech ecosystem that mm -hmm. and he is in, in talking to people like tech stars and, and his friends he, he, he well the same things that made boulder possible did that happen in other great startup communities? So there's a book, it's like 2013, uh, called Startup Communities, uh, inexpensive on Amazon. You should be able to, uh, to, to snag that. That's, or just, you know, Google that and, and see all the presentations. But basically he identified four things that all these communities had in, uh, in common. Uh, and, and it, Turns out he was doing a better research job than a lot of the academics were, but it's uh, and it, but it illustrates that uh, for a lot of people they see ecosystem building as we need to have institutions and processes that will create enabling conditions, and entrepreneurs will magically appear, uh -huh. and that's really not how it works. Uh, if you've been on on as you're probably discovering from um, Professor Snipes uh, that. Yeah. You don't call him Snape, do you? We call, we call him Snipe because he, uh, he wanted us, like when we were talking about the ecosystem builder assignment in the class, so he wanted the class to talk to the real entrepreneurs in the world and just to learn what are the basic things you should learn to enter into an entrepreneurship because people see entrepreneurship like it's a really easy work. But he said like you should talk to the real entrepreneurs and they will let you, they will tell you the whole story of what's going on. Great. Well, I am an entrepreneur. I'm also uh, an academic researcher, and I'm also active in building, uh, trying to build uh, ecosystems. So I've got all three hats that, that maybe will be uh, particularly helpful to you. That, uh, that, so you're interested in advice to potential entrepreneurs Yes. Uh, of um, what they should be looking for in the ecosystem, yes. or does it have any? Is, is in the ecosystem, what they're looking for in the ecosystem. Okay. Oh, a princess, could you not talk so much? <laughs> you can talk. I, 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 it's, uh, I, I talk way too much. So feel free to to break in. So, do you have any specific questions or yes. anything you'd like to have? You'd like yeah, to start. We this? both have some specific questions to ask you so that we can complete this assignment with your help. So the first question I would like love to ask, like what made you chose this profession? Uh, it, it, it's kind of the uh, resultant vector of uh, everything. It was kind of the things I was doing in life. I started out, I wanted to be a physicist. Mm -hmm. I, when I was in high school, I knew I would have the Nobel Prize in physics by 25. That was kind of unrealistic. <laughs> unrealistic, and I went up to Caltech where I had classmates who might actually be able to pull that off. Uh, none, of, none of them have, but my freshman advisor 
recently won the Nobel in for gravity waves. Uh, so that was very exciting because that's you know three decades of very hard work to to have this sudden uh huh. And a lot of things in life are that they emerge that emerge from all of your life experiences and all the things you're working on and it and that whether it's a venture or a research project whatever it is in life that it's that there's this weird accumulation of of all sorts of things even if you start out with a venture very young you're going to probably have another one and another one and another one and you're learning or you should be learning along the way not you know learning about the process, but also learning about yourself. It's it's almost as though entrepreneurship is a, in a lot of ways, is a you know a voyage of self discovery, finding out what you're good at, what you're not good at, what what you like to do, what you don't like to do, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what mat and ultimately, yeah, what matters. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm I, that. I had some entrepreneurial experiences early in life that I would never have called entrepreneurial mm -hmm. uh, until now. That and probably the first couple ventures I was involved in uh, were completely accidental. Uh, but uh, that I was hired by a consulting firm. I, I graduated from undergrad. I went to work for an investment banking firm as a research analyst. My boss decided to go hang out his own shingle, become his, um, be, go, go into business for himself. And he's been very, very successful, but I never would have thought about that, but it kind of pushed me in a mode. I went to work for an economic consulting firm that had just started up. And when they hired me, I had no idea, and this might have been my fault, that they were hiring to be, me to be the acting CEO. And they were still in the valley of death. They were losing money. And I managed to get them through that. I didn't know about the valley of death. But it, it nudged me. And when that, when, when that ran its course, I, I had accident, I, on the way, I had interviewed the new distinguished chair professor of entrepreneurship at Ohio State. And he hired me and then tricked me into being a grad student in researching entrepreneurship. And I was involved in a couple startups while I was still in grad school. Uh, never really thinking about, you know, this is sort of a, that's not the, that's not the hat I wear. That's not, you know, the label I gave myself. Uh, and until later I realized that's been the, that's been the thread that's going, going through all the things that I've done, whether they've been, whether it was physics research or entrepreneurship research, whether it was my, it was going through my teaching, it was going through my, uh, uh, all of my, my career steps is sort of a recurring um, theme. And what's hilarious is I remember realizing this and I'm telling this to my parents and they both start laughing because they knew, they knew and I, I was clueless, uh, but, Finding out things that uh, that matter to others, matter to yourself. Uh, now I can't really think or work in different ways. It would be very challenging for me to go to work for uh, a, a university full time because uh, they are very in, inherently bureaucratic, very bureaucratic, and I'm not really good with that, and I'm not really yeah. I don't really care to do that. But I, I think. What is entrepreneurship? Uh, a thing I like to do in when I'm giving you know a, a talk to a particularly a lay, a lay audience is saying, okay, I would ask you. So, so is on princess is entrepreneurship? Uh, let, let's just define on you know can I get a, a sense of what you mean by entrepreneurship? So entrepreneurship is let's start. Entrepreneurship is about making money, right, princess? Yes. No. Well, not in a way, but it's how. It's not like people is it e is it even about start necessarily starting a business it it's about making cool shit happen yeah and i had a student to, to, you know i in teaching entrepreneurship class and the, i told the students i wasn't going to give them a definition they had to come up with one and this very meek shy student who is like, you know how do, how do it's a nice way to say a good little mormon housewife and 
and just really didn't talk. And all of a sudden she did bang the table and, and said, I know the answer. I'm like, what? Uh, huh? He says, entrepreneurship is not about making money. It's about making cool shit happen. And I was like, okay, I'm so stealing that, you know, <laughs> uh, that it's about making, creating novel value for others. Yeah. And then you get paid. Yeah. And that, that it's about and who isn't really, we're always trying to make cool stuff happen, right? Yeah. Uh, one degree or another, or helping someone else to, to, to do that. So there's this, as risk of, we are, cog, we are wired, our brains to be risk averse. Yeah. Because when you enter a business uh, field, it's, it's about taking risks. Like, well, it's the, uh, in a sense, it's, you know, I'm going to get nerdy here, but it's not about risk. It's about uncertainty. Risk is something you can, you can calculate, you can hedge against. Uncertainty is like, I don't know what's up, what, and what's happening, but you combat uncertainty with information and you can go get information, find out that it's not that you're beating the odds. It's that you're changing the odds by what you've learned and what you know, by the skills, the who you know, that uh, I knew that as an entrepreneur, I, I sucked at all the HR parts of the business. I didn't ever want to hire another person again in my life. I could win the Powerball and I, no. And then I found out you can outsource your whole HR to what they call a PEO, a professional employment organization. Mm -hmm. So I would say, okay, I'm going to need to hire people. I call up my friend, Steve Salai here in Boise. He goes, Steve, I need to hire some people. I need to hire some people. Uh, okay. And they'll handle all the legal stuff, all everything for maybe a hundred bucks a year. Okay. I need three people. Uh, be 300 bucks checks in the mail done. It's like hiring an outsourced, uh, you can hire a great CFO part-time for really very little money. You can ha outsource, have, a, your, have your own general counsel yeah. outsource. I mean, we're living in this world where it's a lot easier that you can focus on your mission. What is it you're, who is it you're creating value for? What is it you're creating? Why does it matter? And, and that's exciting. To, uh, this is the world we live in that we can make cool stuff happen. Yes. It's like some people don't want to, I'm talking about the risk. Some people just say, oh, we're going to fail and this stuff. So I oh just. Oh my God, we're going to fail. Well, I, I see, this like is where the science is. Think about, think about this on my, well, my, from my science background. Mm -hmm. I'm doing an experiment in physics. Uh -huh. if, the first, if it works the first time, I probably did something wrong that you have to try and fail and, and and to get to the point where you've really figured out how to do the experiment so, properly and it, we don't think of it as failure we think it's sort of it's a necessary learning process in the business so it's like oh my god what if the customer what if my customers hate this feature of my product <laughs> and you want them you want them to love it or hate it if they go oh, that's nice that doesn't tell you very much and you know they want to say i'm i will kill you if you if you don't add this feature uh okay or i'll kill you if you do include it it's like that gives you some learning that's inform that's information and that combats uh, yeah so you learn from your failures and then you well but it, but you have to choose to learn and you have to learn the right le lessons mm -hmm. now i want you guys to think about this for, for yourselves or maybe somebody you know, uh -huh. somebody who had a success and learned the wrong lesson from it. Like, I'm a successful, I must be a genius. Oh. Do you all know, have met someone like that? Like, yeah, I'm a genius. <laughs> it's just like they're overconfident about their ability. Well, no, is that they think that that being is my investment banking experience. There was an expression, never, never can, confused brains with a bull market you're making money because the market's going up not because you all that you're all that in a bag of chips um, that that there are a lot of you know is, is getting on the right side of, of market forces is is 
is a pretty much the, the smart thing to do, whether you're you're investing in a portfolio or whether stock portfolio or you're uh, trying to uh, to serve your customers. And with that perspective on value creation, if that's your lodestone, what is the value you are creating? Are you still creating it? Do they still want it? Uh -huh. Then it's you know it, it doesn't take a lot of brains to uh, to move forward. Now, you, with a lot of brains, you can do it better, get yeah. a more efficient supply chain, more, more, you know, better market segmentation, whatever it is that that you need. So, what by the way, you, like motivated to uh, continue this profession, like what makes you motivated? Like you wake up, you say, okay, the, I chose this profession because, like, what motivates you every day to just continue this profession? And uh, well, I get to talk to college students. <laughs> and go oh i must be special oh wait see that's the same thing i'm not special i just i just said yes to to, to shane's uh request it's the value creation it's uh -huh. a chance to make a difference uh -huh. and on a bad day it's annoying the bad guys that's kind of the people who are idiots and and selfish for instance in growing the ecosystem that helping good people and occasionally, um, you know, kicking someone in the shins who, who deserves it. Uh, and the nice thing is that I don't actually have to kick them. They kind of throw their shins at my feet. I mean, if get the metaphor, they, that, but a lot of people just don't understand how to grow yeah. business. There are people mentoring entrepreneurs who don't actually understand how to grow a business. Uh -huh. That is a scary thing to think about. They just like they don't know how to generate new ideas. So how do you think? Uh, how do you generate new ideas? Like they like just care like. Uh, it is uh, my my grad school mentor, the chair professor said they uh, he had there was interviewed on television. They said that yeah, he said well how do you get ideas? He said read, and they go okay read what? And he said a lot. <laughs> uh, that you know I bounce around. I mean, you know, I, at my girlfriend's house, we sit there and just like, you know, channel surf all the stuff on all the channels, all the Netflix. And, you know, it's really scary when I'm, you know, I'm watching a, an English murder mystery and there's a small business and I'm critiquing the small businesses operations while we're there. Uh, which at one time told us it actually, essentially it was a supply chain problem that led to the murder. And fortunately, Anna was impressed by that. <laughs> Most of my friends would be going, what is wrong with you? But being able to, we talk about in entrepreneurship about, and, and in life about connecting the dots. Uh -huh. That first, if you're going to connect dots, you need to, and I, and I wish I could remember who said this, uh, but you have to collect the dots. It is getting lots of points of information and just sort of, you know, you know, it's like a, jigsaw puzzle and you're pushing the pieces around and maybe a pattern you see a pattern uh -huh. and humans are we're wired to see patterns we see patterns that aren't there you know what i mean by the constellation the big dipper no that there is a constellation in the sky that looks like a like a like a, okay. a saucepan uh -huh. and the ancients the greeks romans looked at that and they saw a bear. I think uh, there is some the Cassiopeia, it's a constellation, looks like a messed up W. Oh, that's a mighty beautiful queen sitting on her throne. <laughs> what, what are they? We know that the Oracle of Delphi was buzzed out of her gourd most of the time because there were uh, petroleum fumes coming <laughs> up from underneath the, her, uh, her, her temple. And also that they dealt the oracle was also was, was also um, often paid to uh, give the right answer. Uh, but you think about like what are they? But people see the pattern. Who benefits in looking at it and seeing or dream interpretation that in 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 ancient Rome that the the best omen you could have in a dream was having your throat cut. 
<laughs> like, who comes up with this? The priests, job security. You don't want people to be able to be logical. You want to have this sort of the people that were looking for this, you know, in terms of their, their edge. But also the ability, you know, that, you know, that uh, you have a general who's going to attack and he's lose, he's going to lose, he's going to, everyone's going to get killed. No one will listen. He won't listen to anyone but this mystic. So you make sure the mystic says, oh, today, today is a bad day for the attack. Tomorrow's no, you know, maybe in a year. And then you go, okay, stop. And uh, in fact, in Caesar's commentaries, he actually wrote about this, that, you know, you know, it's like, yes, the general was really stupid to vote all for this, but so Caesar says, I want to hire the guy who talked the Oracle into telling, <laughs> telling him not to do the stupid thing is he knew the power of, of talent. And, and, and to bring it back to these, the ideas is ideas only come uh, from your interactions with people, maybe they're on the, it's on TV, yeah. but it's what are the interactions that, uh, you know, great scientific research partnerships don't happen because they both happen to be sitting on a panel at some important conference. Uh -huh. It's an important conference and they're going, this sucks. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> Want to go get a beer? <laughs> go get a coffee? It is amazing how many Nobel Prize winning teams started yeah. Started that way. I mean, the guys, the DNA guys, mm -hmm. started by yelling at each other because yeah. they both thought the other one was an asshole, and they were both actually correct, as it turned out. But, but they had the their disparate skills. They suddenly were able to to see what no one else, everyone else, had looked at the data and go, I don't know. It's a got to be a triple helix. Yeah, close better. And then, no, it was a double helix, and I you think. How dumb were these people? Well, they just, is it having the right people you can break the frame of, 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 of old assumptions? Yeah. Anyway, uh, but it, but ultimately. Yeah, because when I'm talking about the entrepreneurship thing, so the princes always pop up with the questions, a lot of questions about the entrepreneurship. So I was like, you should ask Mr. Norris about that. He would be the Okay, one. ask me, princess. Okay. You know, is that your first name or is that your title? Um, that's my first name. That's the first okay. Name. <laughs> um, so, so you're not Princess Buttercup from uh, the, uh, no. the famous movie, the no. Princess Bride movie. <laughs> my name's I, I got in a lot of trouble because, you know, Wesley's line is, as you wish. Uh -huh. Have you seen this movie? Which one? As you wish. Princess as Bride. Yeah. Well, you know, he's always saying, as you wish. Well, I was doing that to my new, my girlfriend, we, we met, and she thought I was mocking her, and she had never seen this ultimate chick flick. So I got many points for, and also introduced her to Casablanca, I was like, that. like, okay, you get lucky sometimes. Uh, so tell me your questions. I just want to know, how do you personally view success? Now that is a great question, uh, that, because it's it varies sometimes from day to day it certainly varies from from person to person but if you're going to be successful in, in as an entrepreneur if you're going to be successful in life that that it is not your success is a function of that value you've created how have you helped other people to be successful in their eye in their own eyes that and it's sometimes hard because it's hard for us to, you know, even if it's a friend, it's sometimes hard to be happy for them if they're very successful. Yeah. You know, back to the Nobel Prize, you win the Nobel Prize, you get a lot of congratulatory calls and emails, but a lot of people aren't that happy because they're jealous <laughs> or they think, what did he do? Uh, or they, th and there is a, a great, there's a, a great German word called Schadenfreude, mm -hmm. which is the happiness in other people's misery, especially <laughs> if they deserve it. You know, like a really bad person is, has been very mean to you and some other people, and he 
walks out in the street and he gets knocked over by by, by a crazy bicycle, you know, delivery guy. You go, you can't help but want to laugh. Uh, but there's a in 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 there's a Hindu word, a Sanskrit word called mudita, M-U-D-I-T-A, okay. and that's the happiness in other people's success. Yeah, Even I, knew it the I'm what? Hindu, so I knew it because I'm Hindu, so I know that word. Okay, well, is it? It's the number of people who can do mudita are a lot smaller than the people who can do. Or, yeah, but right. it's it is part of it's kind of an extension of that you put the other person's success first and ironically it usually leads to your own success even financially is you it's nothing i am serving the customer versus i'm delighting my customer it is it is a huge difference so you can, i i'm very fond of of the mudita because i know how hard it is and there but i had a breakthrough you'll be happy to as a hindu you'll be happy to know that that there's someone in town who hates my guts, says horrible things about me all the time, and he had a, a, a re pretty good success recently. So I wrote him a, a note of congratulation and mailed it to him. <laughs> totally freaked him out. He's trying to figure out what is, what's Norris up to? And I'm like, no, it just actually kind of felt like the right thing to do. And my friends are going, you're an idiot. He hates you. Yeah, but he's also dumb as a post. He tells people all the horrible things I do in life, except he doesn't know the horrible things. I feel like I should send him a list. Here are all the bad and stupid things I've done in my life. Tell people those because they're actually true. And But but it's a, it, it's a long rambling way around to say this, that, uh, that I, Oh, I'd like to believe that my definition of success is that I am creating success for others. In basketball, I was a point guard. I could always shoot the ball. I'm not very athletic, but I could. But the moment came when I realized where I really added value was in passing the ball. And it was I when I was still at Caltech that we're playing basketball in a very uh, interesting neighborhood. And you want to be playing basketball. You want to keep the court. You got to win. So you whatever you need to do. And the day I did a lot of no look lob to a guy who dunked it, and you can hear that I can still hear that bang on it. It was like, I'm going, sweet music. You know, that, you know, you know, playing jazz that yeah, I, you know, I could do a nice solo, but making sure the right person, you know, you know, was the next one to follow me. Figuring out, you know, it was uh, that there are a lot of things in life that even in something that's highly individualized, that it leads to that. So success is, what success have you created for others? Mm -hmm. And it's that it, you know, that, and, and you know, often has, you know, very, you know, self, you know, tangible rewards for yourself. So what's your next question? My next question is, what's I'll try to answer shorter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what's your approach to marketing? I this uh, actually went through this. There's a we have a nice, very nice co-working space in downtown Boise, and I'm out there. I'm talking, and I'm having one, another one of these conversations. They are working on some brilliant software for a SaaS uh, SaaS product. So, well, what do the customers think? Well, I want to get the the software finished before I show it to anyone. So the answer is no. You haven't. No, I I haven't talked to any customers. Okay which have been fine if that hadn't been the same answer to the same question two months ago. Uh, it's like, I don't know, are you, are you at this a university? Are you at the school? Yeah, yeah. you're at college right now. Okay. Are you, you're, if, if someone walks by and says there's a, a hundred dollar bill laying on the floor right outside the door of this room, would you go, well, I, I'll go pick it up, but I, first I'm going to ask Morris a couple more questions. You guys would be out there like a shot, uh, is that I can tell. But it is amazing how people, you know, that you, you, you have to put yourself out, out there and find out 
what they love about it and what they hate about it. And people don't want to, you don't want to be told your baby's ugly. But I found out the more people tell me my baby's ugly. Uh, my dog is actually looking at me funny right now. <laughs> I would hope he doesn't speak English, too much English. But is it uh, the marketing is getting out is talking to the customer, but asking them the right questions is again takes me back to my 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 science days the great physicist richard feynman nobel prize winning smart at the time considered the smartest guy on the planet and he said great research is anything in life is about asking great questions anyone can come up with a good question but come up with that great question that's something you really want to know the answer to and it other people want to really know the answer to is, is finding that question that only that it's something that really matters and also you can answer it uh, that 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 it's so as an entrepreneur what are some of the mistakes you wished you could have avoided well i would say that would be about a 10 hour 20 hour conversation uh <laughs> per venture uh you make mistakes all the time. The important thing is recognizing there's a mistake, learning from them and, and fixing it. And sometimes it's realizing it's a mistake, but it's not, you're only gonna make it worse or it's just not, you know, you've got three other mistakes you gotta fix first. And you, sometimes you, you being at peace with the fact you, 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 may, you may never get it completely right. But yeah. the biggest mistake was not listening, you know, to the marketplace. Uh, that at another time it was, uh, it was my external scanning. You know, the 800 pound gorilla came in and stepped on us. You know, Google Bambi versus Godzilla. Uh, it's kind of horrifying, but funny. I should, in hindsight, I think I, there must should have been some way I knew that this major competitor with this, the big player in the field uh -huh. had shown no interest in this niche whatsoever. I should have known. I should have looked harder. What could have I done? What could have, what could I, what could I have done? And a lot of it, you know, coming down to okay. the, the failure to, of, of one of my rules. If I had a, uh -huh. I've had a coat of arms, you know, a, you know, yeah. Uh, it would say, I talk to people on elevators. <laughs> that is, you never know what they know. Yeah. You and never you know. never know who they know. Yeah. And, you know, and it drove my girlfriend crazy till the day we were pushing through this crowd. We're trying to get to this restaurant uh, that had recently opened. And we had some friends who were already there. And we didn't have reservations. We had to, like, make sure, you know, get there. So there's some chance of getting a table. And as we're pushing through this crowd after in this big event, we're sort of helping this nice young man. You know, we kind of like blocked for him and got him through. And you know, yeah, it was not, you know, it felt good. You know, be nice to somebody. And we get to the front door of the restaurant, and and the hostess says, "You don't have a reservation. You're going to have to talk to the maitre d." <laughs> Guess who the maitre d was? <laughs> yes. Anyway, he goes. We don't have any tables. You'll have to sit in the kitchen. So we got the chef's table. <laughs> That's cool. We're at it like, and he was like Gordon Ramsay, cursed and swore and threw things, and I think partly for our benefit. But anyway, that that is the big mistake is to not not talk to people, and I think the third biggest mistake was being a wuss. I knew what the right thing was to do. And I said, I want to get a little bit more information. I want to, you know, you, is that uh, if you're committed to decision, do it. Yeah. Okay. Don't, don't wait. You know, I can, I think I've got this MVP of a product. I am going to, I got to get, get to the point where I'm not, it's not, not vomiting when I see it that and get it out, let someone else vomit on it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, talk to your customer. Sure. Why talk not? to you know, be engaged with the you know your external environments. Can uh -huh. you know, it's again, it's the dot collecting, and then when the time time is to go, you're ready. Go. 
Yeah. I mean, it, and it's, you, you want to know, you want to get to the point where, again, like when I was a point guard, I remember throwing a, a blind pass and I knew I, I decided to do it and it was already, it already left my hand. <laughs> But this is how our brains work. Our brain decides and then tells us, and that gets kind of weird, but it's, uh, we would die because we, we would, we would, you would hate to have to remember to breathe. Yeah. We could never sleep. Uh, anyway, so princess, what else? Um, okay. So These are great questions, by the way. Both of you have been giving me good questions. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes question get really weird. Is how might mindfulness affect your entrepreneurial work? Mindfulness? Yes. Well, if you can figure out what that means, uh, it means a lot of things to different people. But, uh, you know, I mean, it is part of the being uh, intentional about, you know, it's, and it's not, well, I'm going to intentionally go talk to 10 people at this cocktail party. <laughs> I mean, probably going to do that, but is I need to be mindful is okay. Right. Remember, you know, all the little things that you're, you know, that you, you don't want to forget, like, you know, someone gives you a business card, scribble, like who the hell is this? Who is this? Uh, that, that being aware. And I think a lot of that involves, you know, is, you know, you know, honoring, you know, you know, who you are, but also honoring the other people you're dealing with that, you know, it's, yes, we need to be self reflect. It's important to be reflective. Uh, we learn a lot by re reflecting, but it, you also learn a lot by reflecting uh, with your peers that like after this interview, you may come up with some additional questions. You may yeah. think this dude's a lunatic, uh, but, and then when you compare notes, there's sort of another layer of reflection. And so if you need to ask any more questions, if you want to ask any more questions, I'm at your service always. Okay. Thank you for your uh, help, time and your answer. Like well, that. I'm, I'm good. So Princess, you got another, I know you got another question. Um, <laughs> Probably got 10 more, don't you? Uh, not huh? 10 more, but I guess another I'll try one. to answer them rapid fire then. Be mindful of your time. Yeah. Forty two. Well you kinda of did it. Yeah, I did it. Yes. That's what <laughs> That's all we decided to ask you and you asked it all. Well that, well uh, that was very cool. So can I ask you questions? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's say Princess what do this. Cover your ears. You can actually hear me, can't you? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, this never works. So uh, the cliche now, and it's, it, but it's a great cliche in that instead of saying, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because you know the correct answer to that is, yeah. what's, what's this growing up you speak about? Uh, growing older but not up is a, you know, a great motto from the eminent philosopher Jimmy Buffett <laughs> that what is the pro what is the problem in the world you'd like to fix? No matter how small, no matter how big. Yeah. What is it? Because you're going to have eight, probably eight or 10 careers. You're going, if you're even, if you're very successful as an entrepreneur out of the gate, you're going to have, you and the company are going to, to evolve. You may have multiple businesses. What's the first value you want to create? Make something very small. You know, like, is there something annoying you? Like, you know, I wish, you know, Zoom was better at X, <laughs> but, or I wish, you know, your college is in, you know, enrollment computer was worked better. <laughs> that I'm teaching an online class and there is so much security that I've already locked my, it's been only a month and I've locked myself out of, out of the class twice now. Uh, this is not quite the same as locking, you know, a physical door. Uh, you can't climb in the window with, uh, <laughs> with it. But so what, if, I'm giving you a chance to, to think about this. What is, what is, what is, what is something that annoyed you this week, this month, they said, God, somebody should fix that. 
just like business like right now the market is down and how like i'm already indulged into the smoke industry so how the smoke laws are affecting the business right now the smoke laws like the smoke law like they're banning the stuff like the banning the e-cigarettes that a market okay. that affected a lot of sales and we think well that's a good idea we should kill all the smokers yeah that but it does have some it's not that simple and you know so yeah is it figuring out how do you get how do you have an intelligent how do you you know my th- my reaction is how do we create a way for people to talk in a civil fashion over something that's very contentious we got enough political stuff that you know, that may be impossible but you know here is an issue that that I I know that when they banned uh, smoking uh, here in Boise, they included vaping, Mm -hmm. and that probably because they didn't even weren't even thinking about it. And all the bars said we're going to go broke. (laughs) Yeah, nobody went broke. Um, And there was a my one of my my sort of my favorite place to go as great jazz, uh, and one there their senior waiter quit because she said, it's just too weird to, it's, it's, you, it's not, you can't work in a bar where people aren't smoking. It's just too weird. And I thought she didn't even smoke. Like what I did, but that's not very helping. So what is your, but what is the pain point you, what is the, what is the value you could create for someone? Or to, the value for someone yeah what's the value you want to create like for someone like to do something like same thing like their success before my success well you know it's up to you that's just i'm that was me i i hope i'm i know i'd like to think that's a great answer but that's it's a great answer for me. It may not be for you. Well, being honest, I'm also a, a same person like that. Like I never, I'm not like jealous if somebody's being six. Like I some know someone and he's uh, being really successful. I just learn from him. I'm just like uh, how you became successful. Tell me the yeah, idea. I, I, I learn I, I, from you. There's a, a great, uh, very enterprising New Yorker. I've always wanted to interview named Bernie Madoff. Uh-huh. Do you know who Bernie Madoff is? No. <laughs> oh, Bernie Madoff was uh, an incredibly successful accountant. He uh-huh. w- he was president twice of the of the trade association for accountants, and he embezzled about a hundred million dollars from his clients. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's in jail now. And he, but he and he's helping people nonprofits with their 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 their, their, their accounting and their tax returns. But um, he, I'm sure he's got. When he gets out of jail, he's got he's got some money hidden away. Uh, but yeah, it's like, you know, I'm not sure that's my idea of of. But they're also like, what could what could, in a positive way? What could you, you know, what can you learn from you know from all you know from that? Uh, you know, so I'm glad you you said that. So princess, what what what's a headache? Some headache you'd like to get rid of? Um. <laughs> You well, know. for me, thinking as an entrepreneur, because that's what I want to be, um, I want to come out with an affordable, high quality, affordable cosmetic brand, because most cosmetic brands are very, they could be high end and very pricey. And, yeah, that's and, they, and they have like a, a 95% gross margin because it, the ingredients don't really cost that much. Yeah. And it was like finding out I, I met a guy worked for Procter and Gamble and he had experience in the um, in the perfume industry. And he said the important ingredient isn't what we smell. It's the thing that the the binder that keeps it from decaying too fast. Yeah. And he said and they're just it's figuring out what the right mix of those chemicals makes all the difference whether that whether perfume you know perfume sound smells great it's like okay this is just like chanel number no. five and it smells like chanel number no. five for about a half an hour and then a bit, and then in an hour it smells like kerosene um because they, you know this is you know there's these tricky parts of that is if someone could figure out 
you know, a scientific approach or could find something that would bind the sense and so they wouldn't go, go bad, uh, the cost of perfume is going to drop. The cost of, uh, you know, I assume foundation, blush, I, you know, I, not, not no expert on this, on the, on eyeliner, uh, <laughs> mascara, whatever. I, but I, I did, I was on the stage and I, learning to, to do makeup was a little unsettling, but uh, especially when I got good at it, that was like, I, I started not as confident in my masculinity as I, as I would like to be. Uh, fortunately, I'm old enough now not to really, theoretically not to care. But I think that's, people are trying to have, here is a great long lasting uh, cosmetic that, that is both high quality and affordable. Yeah. And that means you're gonna have lower margins than your competitors, which yeah. they're spending the money on advertising. So, if, you know, the idea is to figure out how do I get this out to the market without, you know, without spending vast amounts on, on you know, you know you're not going to do a Super Bowl ad and, and be able to do it affordably. <laughs> yeah. But is there a way to get it out to, and maybe it's the vehicle is actually your, your, the reality is though that the cosmic, Revlon and Maybelline are not selling to you. They're selling to someone who sells it to someone who sells it to Sephora or uh, Macy's that, you know, and it's, it's a very efficient process, but everybody gets a cut and that just adds to the, uh, to the price. If there's a way to, you know, to more directly get this to, uh, for instance, Unilever wanted to get, you know, hand sanitizer bottles to rural visual, rural, rural villages in Africa. And like, but then a little bottle too. I mean, like, there is no way they could do this affordably. So they had to figure out how to do, you know, they said there's no way they could figure out how to do this. And I said, well, there are a lot of villages, their delivery guy is some dude on a bike, on a bicycle who comes in stacked with crap, improbably high. And he's usually paid by Coke or Pepsi. They said, hey, would, would it, you know, could you take our hand sanitizer to these villages? Who so what? On that. Okay. All right. Because I, I, my sense is they don't, making, you know, hairspray or making foundation makeup is not all that scientific, not, it doesn't require, uh, you know, super geniuses. This is the kind of thing that maybe you could hire uh, the underemployed. Uh, you know, is this something you could you could hire the homeless to do this, or hire immigrants to uh, to, to to actually be your your manufacturing force, the disabled, um, and you get points and money possibly for that. Say, so, so Archit, what? Can you top, can you top, she, gave, she had a good one. Can you top it? <laughs> he looks really nervous. Princess, I don't know if you can see his face, but he looks really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now he, actually, he didn't until I said that, then he looked nervous. Uh, anyway, so what, what, what is something you kind of like envision yourself that, yeah, this is something I could make a difference on? I think I see what I see is like I always think I can make a big difference in the business industry or the retail business because I'm always forward whenever there's a retail business for sale. I'm like, I, I, according to me, I just don't want to be like show up, but I think I'm a good salesperson whenever I like I can sell the stuff easily because I just watch all the history behind the stuff I'm selling. I have the whole information and when I sell it, I know what I'm selling. So the customers. Well, and, that, and, and that's important. My dad was a, a stockbroker and he was a phenomenally successful salesman. Mm -hmm. And I never once saw him selling. I mean, he was always problem solving with, with his customers. They would smooth and said, yeah, let's do this. And he also credited he had, had really smart customers, so that helped. That also helped. Uh, that you know he was able to learn was able to learn from them. Is selling isn't about you know you know too many people still think it's about 
you know, scamming someone into buying, buying something. And the reality is you're offering them something that is worth more to them than the dollar bills they have in their wallet. And it's such a simple thing, but we lose, we lose, lose sight of it. So maybe how many of your classmates, uh-huh. like even in this section, this class you're in right now, uh-huh. would say, I could get, I need to get better, be a better at selling. Would you say there'd be a fair number? Mostly like uh, five or six. I would like they need to be good at selling. Okay. So why don't you two, how about the uh, the Princess and Archit uh, consulting firm actually offer to do a little session on what is selling really all about? Maybe maybe Shane will give Dr. S- Professor Snipes will uh, you know maybe give you extra credit, you know, but uh, but it's something that you know if there's an entrepreneurship club in Andrew School that and we have it one entrepreneurship club. is that saying is you know is take the initiative to say you know we need this crazy person in Idaho told ordered us to, you know, to have a, you know, it could be just a, this, you know, a, a, a panel discussion. It could be, but, or it could be one-on-one coaching and saying, you know, you and princess would sit down almost like speed dating. Come give us your pitch or your idea. And you go, that sucks. Try again. Okay. No, here's how you try this a little bit. Yeah. They have, uh, uh, the, the, there's a great, uh, tech media co- uh, company in called GeekWire in Seattle. And one of the things they do is they have an elevator pitch and you're literally on the elevator at the Space Needle. And it, you don't know, but it's probably, it could be a little as 32 to 45 seconds. And you hit the pitch and when you get off, you either get a glass of champagne or you go back down and maybe try again. And the great the great part of the story is Bill Gates himself pitched something and failed. Yeah. Then he went down, failed again. And he got it on the third time. Then he says, nah, I'd rather have a beer. But, <laughs> and ever, everyone assumes that Bill, you know, this was rehearsed. I mean, it was just planned, you know, for the theatrical value of it. But I saw the video. He was like, the second time he was like, oh man, this sucks. Uh, is that when you only have that, you know, it's a big thing not to do doing yet learning to do an elevator pitch. And none of us are really good at it as good as we could be. We can always get better, whether it's 30 seconds or it's a minute. I, there was a, a, a pitch competition that I was uh, helping judge and, and they were showing these videos. They had two minutes and this guy is having a conversation, very happy and very, you know, he's very, you know, very enthusiastic, but he's very informative. And he told us everything you could possibly want, need to know whether it's a good business idea. And I'm thinking, God, he must have really gone over the two minutes, <laughs> two seconds without rushing. He said everything in two minutes and two seconds that you would want to know. And I'm thinking, all I can think is I could, I could never do that. That just not me, but I could, I could try, I could get better is, you know, if you can figure out a way, here's a way if you can find, okay, I, and this is, you know, good for your entrepreneurial resume to say, you know, the coaching other, you know, your, your classmates, and maybe they know something you want to learn and, you know, get everybody in the class to peer teaching, uh, to share, you know, just hijack the class away from 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 Shane and I, I mean Roderick goes by Shane Snipes. Snipes. You know, the problem is that you know I keep thinking of Snape from <laughs> Professor Snape from Harry Potter, and yeah, no, I, I, I would not probably want to go there. I'm sure he's really tired of that. Like <laughs> I get I get Freddy Krueger and Chuck Norris, so those awesome. are better, I think, but. Um, but think about what you could do to, because uh, another one of the bad jokes that I, that I do is, 
and you're saying, well, what do you, what is entrepreneurship all about? Well, let, let's start something easy. I would say to for. Oh, well, well, please call me, contact me anytime. If I, both of you, uh, anything I can be of service. Yeah. Tell, uh, tell your professor I had a blast. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not saying I talked to a lot of idiots. Today has been a good day, but yeah. tomorrow I, I'll be talking to idiots. Uh, I mean, they're not that they're idiots. It's that they, their heart's not in the right place. And that's just, that's a drag. Yeah. But it was nice meeting you. Occasionally they listen. Oh, that was and nice. occasionally I even learn from the bad guys. So, <laughs> and I've learned stuff from you guys. So I'm, Thank you. I, I'm going to, I know that sometime in the next month I'm going to be seeing something online, on TV, reading in a magazine. Oh yeah, we need, we need more. We need high quality, affordable cosmetics. And I'm going to go, why did I notice that? <laughs> and uh, I'm going to drink a toast to my dad and, and, and how to sell the right way. All right. So, well, you know, the copy counts. Right. <laughs> no, it is not snowing yet in Boise, but this is one of the few I haven't broken. Uh, <laughs> anyway, take care. And tell your boss, thank you for the opportunity for me to, to meet you. Thank yes. you. Thank if you. If I learned anything as an entrepreneur, uh -huh. is that we're all in this together. Yes. Okay. Let's forget that at our risk, at yes. great risk. Yes. So we're all in this together. You're part of uh, team whatever, uh, team entrepreneur. Yes. I was going to say team Kruger, but that would be arrogant. Uh, <laughs> and people would think Freddy Kruger, and then that would not be, that would not be good <laughs> for you guys. So, but you're, I consider you part of my team. You're, uh, you're in my contacts list. Uh, so your email shouldn't bounce. But I look forward to it. Thank you. And uh, go with, go with God and uh, have a, uh, or I'm just going to say, <laughs> I'm trying to think of something really hysterically funny to say, and I have nothing. So <laughs> thank you. I'm like that stand-up comedian who goes, oh, I've run out of material. Anyway, so take care and uh, go get them. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.